Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second session in the six part webinar learning series of Keep Louisiana Beautiful's Virtual State Conference. Striving in the new normal, how COVID has changed the face of litter and how we engage with volunteers and keep our volunteers safe. We are so happy that you have joined us this morning. My name is Cabell Mouton and I'm the affiliate and grant manager for Keep Louisiana Beautiful. This is the first time in the history of Keep Louisiana Beautiful we have had a virtual conference. Like most of you, we have had to change the way we do our work, so here we are. Having a virtual conference is advantageous to us because it does allow us to reach others that may not be able to be with us in person in Baton Rouge. Uh, just this session alone, we are able to reach three times the amount of people that would normally be at our in-person conference uh, in Baton Rouge. So um, we welcome the new format and we welcome the new adventure. We think that you will find the learning series over the next month uh, informative. We hopefully will leave you inspired, energized, and give you some tools and resources to support a cleaner and more beautiful Louisiana. We have some very special guests with us today. Before we get started, I have a few uh, housekeeping notes to go over. Uh, first of all, all of you are muted for the duration of the conference session and are all off camera. Uh, we would like the presentations to be as interactive as possible. So we would love to hear from you during the session. We invite your questions. Please find the Q&A box on your screen at the bottom. This is where you will enter your questions. Susan Russell, our executive director, is behind the scenes today managing the question and answer box as well as the chat box. So Mark Benfield from LSU is with us today and he will uh, answer your questions at the end of his presentation. And then at the end of the session, we will bring all three presenters back on screen and we will have um, a Q&A session. So there's also an interactive chat also at the bottom available for comments. This is for comments only. So we would like for you to uh, engage with us. Go ahead, drop us a comment right now. Tell us hello, tell us where you're from. What type of work do you do? What are you interested in learning today? Go ahead, I'll wait. Right down there at the bottom, Susan's waiting. So today's session is being recorded. Once the conference sessions are completed, we will post the recordings along with the answers on our um, website at keeplouisianabeautiful.org in early December. And lastly, all the webinars are free and they're open to everyone. It's not too late to register. They, the sessions are gonna be on Tuesdays and Thursdays throughout the month of November. So please share with your colleagues or anyone that you think that would find the topics uh, beneficial. Um, you can find the full uh, session titles on our website keeplouisianabeautiful.org and you can register there for one or for all. Okay, so that's it for the housekeeping. So we have some very special guests for you today. I'd like to introduce our guest, okay? Many of you remember Mark Benfield, LSU professor for the Department of Oceanography and Coastal Sciences. Mark presented at our conference in 2018 on the microplastic flux from the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico and its environmental impact on coastal food webs. Mark led the team of researchers and recently was recognized by the National Geographic Society when his team was elected as a finalist in the data visual visualization part of the Ocean Plastic Innovation Challenge. Well, he's back with us today, virtually anyway. Hey, Mark. How are you doing? Good. He's gonna be discussing his global research project to map the amount and types of this new class of litter that we see everywhere, PPE litter. You do not have to look far to find it. Those baby nitrate, uh, blue nitrate gloves, face masks and wipes that are considered an individual's response to COVID, but instead it is a different problem because instead of disposing them safely, in the trash, people drop them intentionally or unintentionally, and they end up um, on our roadways. They're everywhere. They're in our shopping carts. They're on the beach. They, um, they're just everywhere. So Mark and his team 
have put a great amount of effort to measure the problem, and he's going to be discussing his his study today. Hey, Mark. Hey, thanks a lot, Kevin. Sure. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us wherever you may be. Uh, so today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about some research that I've been conducting on uh, waste PPE. Can you put up the first slide? Uh, which is a new class of plastic pollution. There we go. Okay, uh, so next slide. So I think we're all aware of the campaign to encourage and in many cases mandate the use of masks to reduce the rate of infection of COVID-19. Every state and indeed almost every country has a mask up campaign of some sort. And masks are just one very visible form of personal protective equipment or PPE. Other PPE can include gloves, disinfecting wipes, hand sanitizer, and the various packaging, of course, that goes with that. Um, in addition to these signs, you've probably also noticed another troubling trend, and Cavill was talking about this a moment ago, and that's the prevalence of discarded PPE on our streets, in parking lots, and in our open spaces. And there seems to be an almost epidemic of these items. They're particularly common around areas where PPE is needed. So the parking lots of shopping centers and supermarkets on pedestrian areas, near bus stops and in parks and other recreation areas. And each of those items is potentially just one rainfall away from beginning its journey to the sea. And they are getting into the sea. There's a growing body of evidence that a lot of this waste PPE is already entering our oceans or has entered our oceans. In early 2020, environmentalists in Hong Kong began to report that masks were common in their parks, along their trails, and on their beaches. Divers and submersibles in the Mediterranean have found masks and gloves accumulating on the seabed. And a little closer to home, masks and other PPE have been documented in waters along all the US coasts. In my title, I mentioned that this is a new class of waste for the oceans. So to illustrate that, let's take a look at what we typically find on our beaches. And these data I'm showing come from the Ocean Conservancy for the US uh, for beach cleanups, but the items here are similar to what is found on beaches around the world. And you can see from this pre-pandemic list that masks, gloves, and wipes don't appear in the top 10. What we tend to see are cigarette butts, food wrappers, beverage bottles, bottle caps, straws and stirrers, other plastic bags, grocery bags, beverage bottle, glass beverage bottles, uh, can <clears throat> aluminum cans, and then styrofoam cups and plates. Honestly, PPE is a pretty rare item, except in some parts of Southeast Asia. Now, the wearing of face masks to prevent infection, sorry, next slide. Uh, Forgot to say next slide, so we actually need to move ahead. Next slide. And next slide. I apologize for that. Um, the wearing of face masks to reduce infection isn't a common practice in North America or in Europe. I think we've all seen images of people wearing them in China or Japan when they have a cold or other respiratory infection. And it's a good practice, but it's never really caught on here. And one might argue that it still isn't catching on, but that's another subject. In any event, I think we've seen the shelves of masks and other PPE available uh, for sale in stores today, big box stores. I took this picture in Home Depot on the lower left. Uh, but to emphasize how novel these are as a new class of marine debris, take a look at the historical and the projected sales of masks in the United States, both pre-pandemic and this year. So we can see uh, in that right-hand graph 2016 to 2019, very low numbers uh, of uh, disposable face masks compared to 2020. Um, so these sales were insignificant until the pandemic hit. And even then it took about five months for masks to be commonly available to consumers. Next slide. So I mentioned that waste PPE is only a rainfall away from a journey to the sea and that's really the pathway. So masks and gloves and other PPE on our streets get washed into storm drain systems when it rains. And from there, they travel via canals, bayous, and rivers to the oceans. And I've taken all these pictures. The, the top picture was taken in Baton Rouge, as was the bottom one. Picture on the right is down at Elmer's Island in Louisiana as well. 
Next slide. Second. Okay. So I've been studying plastic pollution for a few years now. I've used a drone to document plastic pollution on Baton Rouge's uh, streets and in the stormwater canals and along the beaches on our coast. So I'm pretty familiar with the usual suspects that we see on our streets, plastic bottles, bags, styrofoam, and the other items that are typical plastic waste in our environment. So when LSU closed its doors uh, to in-person classes in March, I began to work from home. I keep my sanity. I started exercising more by walking around my neighborhood, which is Beauregard Town near downtown Baton Rouge. And I began to encounter things that I had never seen on our streets before. Disposable masks, uh, acrylonitrile gloves, wipes, packaging for these items, hand sanitizer bottles, even nasal swabs. And these items made me wonder how abundant they were. So I set out to try and quantify them. And that's the project I'm going to talk to you about today. Next slide. Okay, so I wanted to answer three questions. I wanted to know what is the abundance of waste PPE on our streets? How does it change over time? And how does it vary spatially? Um, and I wanted a record of all these. I, I already had an app on my phone that I could use to track my walk or run and the distance that I went. All I had to then do was estimate the width of the area in front of me that I was surveying. And then I could multiply that by the distance I traveled to get an estimate of the area that I'd visually covered. My phone had a camera that geotagged every image with latitude and longitude. So I put together my own survey protocol and I started regular walks along every street in my neighborhood. And so next slide. So here's my neighborhood, uh, part of uh, Google Earth. Uh, so I live downtown. You can see the uh, off ramps to uh, the bridge over the Mississippi and the uh, I-110 I South corridor on the right hand side. Uh, next slide. Here's a closer shot. So this is the area that I set out to map PPE in. So it's bounded by Government Street uh, at the top, um, St. Uh, Ferdinand on the left, uh, 110 and 10 on the south. Next slide. And so if I mask out the area that I've surveyed, which is shown here in yellow, I can easily count up uh, and estimate the total survey area. It's 6.56 hectares. For those of you who are not used to hectares, a hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters. Uh, and I grew up in Canada and I'm a scientist, so the metric system is something I'm familiar with, but I realize it's not something everyone deals with. So I have visually scanned each time I walk my neighborhood, 6.56 hectares. Next slide. So I take pictures with my camera and every image has encoded in it the latitude and the longitude. So you can see that minus 91 point something and 30 degrees point something. Those are the latitude the longitude and the latitude of every object. So I can take, I wrote some code that uh, stripped out the data from my pictures and I then put it into a text file, converted it to something called a KML file. And that's the language used by Google Earth to visualize things. So let's take a look at the, this in Google Earth. Next slide. So here are the results from an early survey in eight, early April of 2020. Again, you can see the area that I surveyed in yellow Gloves are triangles, wipes are squares, and masks are circles. You can see they're all quite common in my neighborhood. And so then by adding up the total numbers in each category and dividing by the survey area, I can get an estimate of the density of each item. Next slide. So let's take a look at some trends. So I conducted these surveys from April uh, to October, and I, I did them. You can see the frequency was every couple of days initially, and then I spread it out to every week or every couple of weeks. Um, after that. Um, so if we take a look at the top panel, which is uh, gloves, you can see that the uh, gloves have remained fairly constant over time. The, there's a slight non-significant negative slope, but it's more or less a horizontal line. So the densities of gloves aren't changing much over time. If we look at the second panel, which are masks, masks have definitely increased and uh, they might be leveling off now. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it was almost impossible to find masks if you weren't in the healthcare field when the pandemic started. 
but by late May, they became quite common. And so did messaging about masking up. And I think that's what you're seeing in this trend. The increase of availability of masks translates to an increase in their prevalence in our litter. The third panel are wipes. You can see that uh, they were initially fairly low and then they uh, increased to a more or less constant uh, abundance. Um, and then the bottom are additional other categories. These are things like uh, packaging for masks, gloves or wipes, Purell bottles, um, nasal swabs, I've even found a COVID-19 test kit. Um, so you can see that that's more, it was more or less zero until about early June, and then it increased and is probably more or less constant. Next slide. One of the things I'm interested in is losses of PPE. And we know that losses of PPE, particularly via wind and water, are important because it's wind and water that's going to put them into our oceans. Um, Clean, the other categories are city cleaning operations, the street sweepers, and of course, um, I may be able to get some data on that, although it's doubtful, and then cleanups by concerned citizens, and I probably won't be able to get data on that. However, in my neighborhood, I did encourage the folks in my neighborhood via Nextdoor and Google Groups to leave the PPE alone. Um, but one thing you can do is you can take the differences in numbers over time and you can overlay rainfall and you can see some trends. So let's look at the next slide. So here again, I'm showing you gloves, masks, and wipes, but now I'm looking at differences between successive surveys. And the bars, the blue bars are rainfall in Baton Rouge in millimeters. So in some cases, we do in fact see declines. Uh, if we look uh, just late, to late June, uh, you can see there was a heavy rainfall event and we get declines across the board. Um, again, if you look in uh, uh, late August, we had, we had some lower rainfall, but we get declines of uh, gloves and wipes. So uh, sometimes, but not always. And I think the relative flatness of my neighborhood has a lot to do with this. I watched where uh, items were before and after rainfalls and often they would move, but it took more than one rainfall to get them to the nearest storm sewer. In areas like San Francisco, where topography is steeper, the losses might be a lot more pronounced. Next slide. I'm also interested in what's new and what's old. I mean, anytime you take a, do a survey, you're getting a snapshot of what's out there at any one time. But the tricky thing about measuring PPE in the environment is that the number of objects changes over time, and that change reflects both new deposition and losses. I have the data to actually determine if each item is new or pre-existing because of the geotagging. Um, and I can also compare what they look like in the images, but it's very time consuming. But I've done a little bit of it. And you can see here how the numbers of items present, and those are the cyan squares in the graph connected by the line, um, it reflects both new objects, which are items in red, and losses of uh, objects, which are items in blue. Next slide. So I wanted to expand this project. Um, I started the project and, and I reached out to colleagues at universities elsewhere and asked them what they were seeing. And they often came back and said, well, how do we go about surveying it? So I put together a survey protocol and I shared that with them. And basically it turned into a community science project. All you need is a fitness app to track your route. You need to estimate the width of the area you're surveying in front of you. You can do that visually just pacing it off or you can use measuring apps on your phone. You need uh, the GPS tagged images of PPE. And then I set it up so you could upload the data to a box.com or a Google Drive account. Next slide. Now what helped is we got a lot of initial media coverage for this project and it's ongoing. Um, and these are just a couple of them. But this media coverage really helped me to put together a community science project to recruit other citizens, not just academics, in uh, other cities in the United States and in countries around the world to help with this effort. Next slide. So this is where we're at right now. Uh, these, this shows our North American survey sites, the numbers, in each icon indicate the number of different people participating. You can see I've got pretty decent coverage in Louisiana, uh, but I have people all over the United States and one person in Toronto, Canada, 
I also have a person in Hawaii uh, in Oahu who's not uh, shown on this. Next slide. I have uh, surveys from uh, Europe as well, uh, from Glasgow, from Bonn, Germany, uh, from uh, a little suburb of Venice, Italy, and a very uh, comprehensive data set from uh, Kanakale in Turkey. Next slide. I also have uh, three uh, people doing surveys in Southeast Asia, in Shenzhen, China, in Hong Kong, China, and in uh, Taipei, Taiwan. All right, so I'm, the data are being analyzed, but I want to show you uh, some uh, data from different sites, particularly hotspots. Next slide. So uh, this is, I'm going to show you data from the worst place in the world that I've found, and it happens to be a suburb of Brooklyn, New York, in the Crown Heights neighborhood. Um, so uh, Brian Menegas, who's a journalist with Gizmodo, um, he wrote an article on my study, and I recruited him to uh, get involved in this. And so I'm going to show you one, uh, results from one of Brian's surveys. Uh, I think this is from April. Uh, next slide. And I'm only showing you masks, okay? So these tri every triangle here represents a mask on the street in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. And the numbers are just disturbingly high. And the, the plots for wipes, there's even more of those, and gloves uh, are equally high. So very, very high prevalence of uh, this waste PPE in uh, Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Next slide. Here's a, a survey from a suburb in Chicago. Also, this shows gloves, wipes, and masks. Uh, also quite high, but, but not that different uh, from what I see in my own neighborhood. Next slide. So what do we do about this? Um, when I reached out to uh, a colleague of mine in Shenzhen and asked her to start uh, doing surveys, uh, she told me something interesting. She said PPE was really rare on her campus. Now there's a big campus, I've been there many times. Uh, it involves uh, Xinhua University, uh, the University of Beijing, uh, Harbin uh, Research Institute. It's, they're on this sprawling campus. And it's not as though people in, in Shenzhen don't litter. If you look in that top left picture, you can see they litter plenty. Uh, there's plenty of plastic waste. But Yelu told me that uh, while PPE litter was abundant, PPE was really rare. Uh, and she told me that the reason for this is that the government put, the municipality and the universities put PPE disposal bins all over campus. You can see one in that top right picture. And this may provide an explanation as to why PPE, uh, but not other types of waste, is so rare in uh, Shenzhen in the university town area. So uh, I think providing people with a ready means and identifiable means of disposing of their PPE is really important. Next slide. Now, garbage, garbage cans aren't that common in Baton Rouge. There's plenty of them downtown and on the river walk, uh, but uh, in my neighborhood, there are only two. And we do see people use them. That picture in the top was in the one in my neighborhood. You can see some gloves in there. But of course, some people ignore the opportunity that lower waste can is right outside the courthouse downtown. And, you know, you could see PPE on the ground around it. Uh, similar, there's another picture from downtown, some wipes uh, right next to a can. Um, so I think people are inherently lazy, no offense to the people, not the people who are listening to this talk, but uh, I think we need to provide people with every opportunity we can to dispose of their PPE and make it as easy as we can. Next slide. So what can we do as individuals? Well, the first thing is don't use gloves. Gloves don't serve, they don't help anything. All they do is provide another plastic surface for you to contaminate. People are more likely to touch things with contaminated gloves or touch their faces, and then you've got to dispose of them. Um, so the second thing is get a reusable mask. I think the irony of the shortage of masks in the United States, and I had a whole bunch sent to me by colleagues, of reusable masks sent to me by colleagues in China early on in the pandemic, where you could get them, but you could not get them here. We encourage this Etsy cottage industry of making reusable masks. And many of them are made from cotton and they cost a little more money. And so people are less inclined to throw them away and they're more inclined to wash them and reuse them. So I think get a reusable mask. The third thing is carry a Ziploc bag around for your used PPE. Um, 
put your PPE, have a plan, put your PPE, if you're using, if it's used in the Ziploc bag, then you'll be, uh, you won't worry about it contaminating your purse or your pocket or your car. And you notice in that picture there, I've snipped the elastic cords from that mask. Um, it's a bit like the uh, six pack ring, snip the six pack rings. It's kind of sad. It's kind of a de facto acknowledgement that they might wind up in the environment uh, in, at some time. But by snipping those elastic bands, you make it much less likely for wildlife to get entangled in them should these things blow out of a landfill and get into the environment. And then finally, encourage merchants to provide signage and proper disposal options for people. If you go to a store and you see PPE around it, tell the people inside that, that all they need to do is put some signs up and uh, put some disposal uh, options for people. I noticed a lot of masks and gloves around the Belle of Baton Rouge Casino on the walk uh, next to the Mississippi. So I spoke to a manager there and I asked them to put signage up and PPE disposal uh, bins, and they did. And uh, you know, we'll have to look at my data to see whether that helped or not. And then finally, next slide. Don't discard PPE in the streets. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but tell everyone you can not to discard their PPE. It may have protected you. Next slide. Next slide. But there are plenty, still plenty of opportunities for that. Oh, go back for that uh, PPE to harm others. Uh, and they're not people, but they are birds, they are fish, they are marine mammals. Uh, and every piece of PPE that is discarded is gonna break down into millions more pieces of microplastic over time. So we're just compounding that microplastic problem. Uh, next slide. So that's my talk. I just wanna end by thanking all of my volunteers from around the United States and around the world who've gone out and uh, taken the time to collect all this data. We're gonna write it up. Um, I have a, uh, a Gmail address, it's covid19waste at gmail.com if you're interested in conducting surveys and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. That's wonderful, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a few questions for you, Mark. Where, most, where were most of the survey sites? Were they residential or did they include medical and business corridors? And if so, um, would you find a difference? Yes, okay, so um, most of my surveys tend to be in residential areas, but I did have someone in Baton Rouge who lives out near the, um, the medical corridor um, out by Our Lady of the Lake and uh, Baton Rouge Clinic in that area. And uh, so, so I do have some data from there. And yeah, you do tend to find a lot more PPE outside of these clinics, though hopefully a lot of them are getting on board with putting signage up and helping people to understand that there are places to dispose of them. Uh, but yeah, I, it's not, um, I can't dictate where people do their surveys. I have to just accept that they're doing surveys um, where they feel comfortable about walking around. Sure, sure. So uh, Mark, a lot of our participants um, today are um, affiliates, Keep America Beautiful affiliates, organizations, um, state agencies, we have universities, schools um, that are attending the webinar today. And can you tell us something that uh, provide for them something that you learned that this audience could take away and bring back to their community? Yeah, sure. That's, that's a really interesting question. So one of the things I've learned is that um, litter accumulates more litter. So I would find gloves or masks and often they're in a surreptitious spot, uh, you know? So I think people inherently realize they're not supposed to throw these things into the environment. So they'll toss them behind a bush or behind a tree, someplace out of sight. Someone else will see those and they'll do the same thing. Um, so I think in that regard, removing this stuff when you find it, for the purposes of my study, I encourage people not to do that. But I think at this point, um, documenting the trash and then removing it in a safe way is important. Get a litter getter, or, you know, use gloves uh, for that purpose. Don't put yourself at risk. Um, but getting this stuff out of the environment as quickly as possible, I think is going to uh, make it less likely that other people will be uh, encouraged by it and, and do the same thing. 
Do you think that PPE signage would be beneficial to put on the trash receptacles? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I do. Um, the only issue I have with PPE being disposed of in, uh, you know, in let's say the curbside bins that people have, um, if you don't put it in plastic bags in your regular bag, if you don't contain it, um, when they pick it up, a lot of it gets blown out or, or spilled from the back of the truck. Um, but yeah, I do think that I, I really like the idea from Shenzhen, China, of having dedicated PPE signage. And then also, you know, billboards. We have all the masked up messaging as you drive along highways. Um, I think it's time to start having some messaging about proper disposal of PPE. Right, I, I agree. Um, you know, we have a receptacle grant, it keeps Louisiana beautiful, that's available to our uh, affiliates in Louisiana. And part of that grant reporting is they do a litter assessment prior to installation and then post installation of the receptacles. And we have found consistently that there is a 50% uh, reduction in litter when there's a trash receptacle uh, available for someone to do the right thing. So if they are there, we find that people do do use them. So um, that's yeah. a good point. You know, the other thing, going back to your earlier question about what can schools and groups do, do a survey of your neighborhood and figure out where the hot spots are, because that's where you want to put your, uh, your garbage can or your, your uh, uh, litter receptacle. Yes, absolutely. So the takeaways are uh, don't use gloves, use reusable masks, Ziploc to hold the PPE, and um, disposal and receptacle options use the use those to dispose of your your PPE. right and encourage you know businesses to do the same thing yes yeah. awesome well this has been fantastic mark uh yeah. I, just, I just feel a little smarter in your presence i gotta tell you you're very you're very <laughs> impressive uh would you stay with us to the end of the presentation absolutely i'm going to mute my uh my video and my mic and i'm looking forward to the next talk Okay, great, great. Thank you, Mark. We'll see you in just a little bit. Next, you guys, we have two guests with us today that uh, you're really going to enjoy hearing what they're doing locally. Next, we have with us today, Andy Brown. Hi, Andy. Hi. Andy leads the efforts of Washita Green. It's an organization made up of three Keep America Beautiful affiliates in Washita Parish, Monroe, and West Monroe. Andy has spent the last 12 years diligently working in the recycling industry and previously served on the board of the Louisiana Recycling Coalition. She has spent the last two and a half years serving as president of Keep West Monroe Beautiful. She's also a board member for Washita Green. So we're gonna hear from Andy on how the local group Washita Green pivoted to meet, pivoted. Is everybody tired of that word? pivoted, pivot, I, I can do without ever hearing that word again, I think, to meet our ever-changing logistical challenges of organizing community improvement projects during the pandemic. Hi, Andy. Hi, Cabell. How are How's you? Today? I'm great. 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 Thanks Thank for having me. Thank you for being here. Another local group that has done an excellent job of meeting the challenge of keeping volunteers safe and meeting challenges is Parish Proud in Lafayette. Hi, Katie. We have with us today Katie Dupree, Executive Director of Parish Proud. Hey, Katie. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Katie is a Lafayette native who spent 10 years away working in New Orleans, Chicago, and Montana. Montana's beautiful before returning home two years ago. She was moved by the desire to get involved in finding ways to improve the community she calls home. She has, thank you for coming home, by the way. Of course. She has more than 10 years of experience working in both the nonprofit and for-profit sectors, most recently as the program director for the Lafayette Engagement and Research Network Initiative at CGI. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes, we're glad that you're here with us today. Auntie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it over to you and um, if you would like to get started. Okay, great, thank you so much. So Washita Green is a nonprofit that serves as the umbrella organization for Keep Washita Parish, Keep West Monroe, and Keep Monroe Beautiful. Um, that being said, obviously we have a large volunteer base. Uh, we may have some smaller events where we have 25 plus volunteers show up just for a small community cleanup. 
or a beautification project, we focus on beautification, litter abatement, recycling, and environmental education. So moving forward, of course, COVID kind of put a, a halt to things because we were, we were having smaller events and larger events. Some of our larger events were causing us to um, have, you know, literally run out of supplies. <laughs> we would have 150 to 200 people show up for these events. And so when COVID happened, we were just kind of like, what are we going to do? Obviously, we couldn't have groups of 150 to 200 people meeting. Um, for instance, can we have our, our first slide? We had, um, you know, our Great American Cleanup, we had 166 volunteers show up um, from one school. We had a community cleanup in the Riverbend community and we had over 80 volunteers show up that day. Uh, we had our Leaders Against Litter, again, 100 volunteers showing up. So obviously we had to, to pivot, as Capel said. Um, if, we, if we could go to our next slide. We had our restoration park cleanup last year and we had 127 volunteers show up for a park cleanup day. This is great when you have 127 volunteers, you can accomplish a lot. We were able to clean up over 8,000 pounds of litter and debris from the roadways, the ponds in the park, um, some of the streams that surround the roadways on the areas surrounding the park. We also were able to repaint some playground equipment we were able to refresh all the flower beds. So when you have this many folks, you can obviously accomplish a lot. Well, when COVID came along and we had to come to a screeching halt, obviously we met some challenges. Um, and talking with our code enforcement officers, we learned that they were seeing just litter piling up because of things like, you know, the community service workers weren't allowed to go out and do these things. They weren't allowed to send city crews out into the roadways to pick up in certain areas and things like that. We're very limited. And obviously our, our community cleanup events were shut down for a while. Um, actually from March through June of this year, we weren't allowed to have any of those types of events. So in seeing that we had a problem and speaking with our code enforcement officers, um, our, our previous director, Stuart Hodnett and code enforcement officer, Marie Knight made a video encouraging folks to go out into the community where, where they lived, where they worked. You know, some folks were working from home, some folks weren't, but we were all going a little stir crazy, spending that much time in the house. Um, so we encouraged folks to get out. Hey, we've got supplies. If you'd like to come by the office and pick them up, we can sit them outside for you. Send us an email, send us a text. We'll provide the supplies you need to, to hold cleanups in your neighborhood, to hold cleanups around your office if you're there. Um, so that offered folks, you know, that maybe were at risk or didn't want to be in contact with folks that weren't in their bubble to get out and grab the supplies. You know, they could pick them up on the doorstep. We had a few of our staff members who, you know, gloved up and masked up and delivered supplies to, or supplies to organizations so that they could um, basically make a difference. If we can go to the next slide, you'll see some of the folks in the community that were actually working in their own communities to get out and, and pick up litter and make a difference because we were seeing, as Mark stated, large amounts of PPE. Can't tell you how many masks and gloves and things that I've picked up out of parking lots and off my street. You know, I don't know if they, they were thrown out the window or what, but um, you see members of the community getting out and, and making a difference. And if you'll notice in one of the photos, Carrie Ray, he's one of our volunteers that works with us a lot. He got really creative. He put his kitchen trash can on a dolly and rolled it through the streets uh, while walking his dog and picked up litter. You know, I was getting, we were getting text messages and, and things. Hey, I picked up three bags in my neighborhood. Hey, me and my coworker, you know, we were the only ones in the office today. So on our lunch break, we walked and picked, picked up a bag. You know, that's what we were seeing. And so it showed us that folks, you know, wanted to continue to volunteer, even though they were limited to what they could do. Um, we, were, we were seeing a great, a great group of people making a difference. We could go to the next slide. After the guidelines were released a little um, in June, late June, we were able to have our first drive-through cleanup. Um, we were trying to think of ways to make sure that volunteers were safe, to make sure that you know folks weren't cross-contaminated, that we were staying within our numbers. So what we did was we had folks drive through. We chose an area that was very large outdoors 
um, so that folks wouldn't have to be on top of each other. We did, we encouraged folks to sign up online so that they wouldn't be crowding into a registration area and filling out forms. We did an online sign up and um, we had the, the volunteers drive through. They came uh, along the street. They were handed supplies by volunteers that were masked and gloved for the folks in their vehicle. And they were assigned a section of the park or cemetery area to clean up. They, um, they moved along the, the roadway. They parked their vehicles in the area they were assigned and they picked up. They were instructed to, when they were finished, to put their gloves in one of the bags, tie the bags off, sit them by the side of the road. They drove back through, turned in their supplies to us, the vest and grabbers, and then the vests were washed. And the, and the grabbers, as you can see here, uh, Kevin, one of our Parks and Rec employees, he's sanitizing all of our grabbers with a sanitizing gun for us. And we actually cleaned up over 6,000 pounds that day. It was an area that really needed some work and we got a lot done. Um, again, we had to just be innovative on what we were doing and you know, being mindful of the safety of the volunteers being mindful of, you know, others, you know, telling folks, hey, you know, stay in your groups, things like that, which people know and they're doing. Um, you just have to remind them and, and let them know, hey, we're here to make a difference, but we also want to keep everyone safe. So you can go to our next slide, please. And this is the QR code that we came up with. Um, we, we've got a wonderful team of folks that help us out and, and we have a wonderful man on our staff that's kind of helped with this. So now folks don't have to come to the table to check in. They don't have to sign the release form and all of this. We've made a way that they can um, have a, um, essentially they can have, they can walk up with their phone. I'm sorry. They can walk up with their phone, scan this QR code. And I can actually give you a demonstration. If you have your phone on hand and you can scan the QR code, and um, with your photo app and it will prompt you to our website. You can fill out the form there. It's just a few little questions and choose the Keep Louisiana Beautiful Conference as your event. And it will send you an email letting you know that thank you for registering, thank you for volunteering, depending on whether you're registering or volunteering. Um, they can check in and out of events this way. They can sign the photo release and the liability release form, and they can request sheets for volunteer hours, all with this, this one QR code. Um, it's a quick and easy process. It also allows us to check volunteer hours more accurately so that we know exactly, hey, these folks only stayed for an hour, these, whereas these folks checked out and they stayed for three hours. Um, and it allows us to use more, more technologically friendly things and less paper so that we're more, being more environmentally conscious. So um, that's just an option for folks that, you know, maybe, maybe you want to be able to start holding group cleanups. You don't want folks to have to sign in because we don't want everybody using the same paper and same pens. You know, you never know who someone's been exposed to, who you've been exposed to that, that may be COVID positive. So you've got to be mindful of others. And this is just a way that we can be considerate. Um, so far, this has worked out for us pretty well. And if anybody has any questions about that, I'd be happy to you know, answer those at the end. Um, one more thing that we've seen a lot of success with is a mapped cleanup. And um, what we did was we took a community, we had our first one of these October 24th. We took a community, broke it down into five sections. We had groups come in and as the, normally when groups come in, it's usually together, we'd had them come in, pick up supplies from a pre-staged area so they weren't touching, you know, there was, it was basically contactless and then they could sign up online. Um, they were handed, they were appointed a group leader and handed a map and then they went out into the community and their group covered that area. Once they were done, they came back, dropped off the supplies and then obviously we were, we sanitized everything there. This actually allowed us to cover an entire community with 30 volunteers in less than three hours. We picked up um, over 3,000 pounds of litter, nine tires, multiple pieces of small furniture, um, just really made an effort with, with a smaller number of volunteers. You know, we covered a lot of ground, got a lot accomplished and made a big difference in that community. What we've learned is people really do want to volunteer. They wanna help, they wanna make a difference. They wanna live in, a, in an area that's clean. They wanna be in an area that they made a difference in. You just have to get creative and figure out a few ways that, um, you can make things happen. 
So that's everything I have, Cabell. If you have any yeah. questions. Yes, thank you. We, you do have a few questions. Would you would you mind answering a few questions? Sure, go ahead. So could you explain, Andy, a little bit more about how the volunteers signed up online and what computer program was that? Um, that is actually through our website. The QR code that they use is, is one that runs through our website. Um, that is a question that I could get more information on. I don't handle any of that particular portion of it. We have Cameron who works with us that does, does all of the technological things for us. So, um, but I could definitely get more information on that, but it's through our website, washtalkgreen.org. Washtalkgreen.org. Okay, I would like to check that out. So do the volunteers select a specific location, Andy, or do you put them where, where they're needed? Um, generally, as far as like the drive through cleanups, mm -hmm. we place them, you know, we tried to spread everyone out and said, okay, you take the north corner of this area, you take the south corner, et cetera. We usually have a spot in mind or several spots in line or like the mapped com community cleanups. We had designated areas we wanted to cover and we sent volunteers to those areas. Okay. Um, did they, the volunteers sign a waiver online before they... All of that is in the, the QR code for contactless check-in. They can sign their waiver. They can request volunteer hour sheets and you know sign the, the picture release form all in one step. They just check a box and then it asks them to, to sign their name with their finger on their phone. Gotcha. So that was another question was who actually set up the QR code? And you mentioned Cameron. Yeah, Cameron Brister with Square Plan IT. He is a genius at all things technological. So he has helped us out with that and helped us see how we can do things contactlessly. Um, and, and I think it's important to have a partner like that, you know, that because I don't know how to do that. You, you probably don't either, you know, so I think it's important to find somebody who can help you with those type of things. They're yeah. out there, you know. I'm making a note right now to, for an IT person, for a board member. Yes, that would be good. To, yes, yes, to have that on, on board. Um, so how much would that call, if you don't mind me asking, how much was that to build out your website and for Cameron to develop the QR code and all the components that go with that? Well, we were actually rebuilding our entire website and we had to, you know, purchase some new domain names and things like that. Um, I believe it was $2,900 for all of it, um, you know, and that includes a, a maintenance section too, to where if things need to be changed, things are maintained and that kind of thing. You mentioned about tracking the pounds of litter. Is that something that is tracked through the QR code or is that something separate? It's not currently, but it is something that we eventually want to track. Right now we're counting our bags and normally we have a trailer on site. We have a couple of both city companies that help, you know, city waste companies, and then also like our public works department. And then we have a few um, partners that work with us, Waste Connections, R2 Rentals, that will donate dumpsters and then they, they send us the tonnage once they pick them up is how, is how we're tracking that. Okay, great. All right, awesome, awesome. I'm always amazed at the dedication of the volunteers out of the Washita Parish area. You all are definitely community and come together. Um, you guys are amazing. Thank uh, you. Would you hang on to the end of the session? I'm gonna bring on Katie and then we'll all come back together at the end. Absolutely, sure. Thank you, Auntie. Thank you. Hi, Katie. Are you still with us? I am trying to start my video. There it is. Thank you for your patience. Of Last course. but not least, Katie Dupree with Parish Proud. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me and thank everyone for joining us today. Um, all right, so I'm Katie Dupre with Parish Proud. Um, I am amazed by the two speakers before me um, and also in good company, I know, because a lot of the programs and a lot of the pivots that Parish Proud went through um, have already been discussed with Andy and Mark. Um, there was a slight difference between ours, which I'll touch on in a minute, but the presentation that I have for you today is a brief overview of Parish Proud and kind of why we exist and what we do and how we do it and then a little bit more detail about how we responded to the pandemic um, and how we really wanted to engage our volunteers and provide them with the resources they needed to do 
what they can, when they can, and where they were able to do it. So, can we start the presentation? Awesome, and next slide. Okay, so Parish Proud um, is a private 501c3 uh, parish level organization focused on supporting, promoting, and enhancing existing efforts working towards increasing visual vibrancy, decreasing visual pollution, and improving the overall quality of place in Lafayette Parish. Next slide. Um, we do this because we have a vision of Lafayette Parish being an attractive and connected place that compels residents to exercise pride through institutional, organizational, and individual investment. And that could be time investment, that could be money investment, or that could just be saying hi to your neighbors. You're investing in your community through exercising pride. Next slide. Um, so again, we're dedicated to improving the quality of place. And how do we do that? We equip stakeholders with resources that help build their capacity to transform the pride we feel into pride that we can see. Next slide. And as Mark and Andy have both uh, gone over, we create a lot of, of waste and the pandemic really exaggerated what that waste looked like. It introduced a new class of waste, the PPE. Um, it was challenging to get a large number of people in one area at one time to pick up the newly created um, waste. And so what Parish Proud did was we asked, how can we get more people picking up more litter more frequently in more areas safely? How can we do that safely? Um, so next slide. Next slide. Um, so one of our uh, solutions was to hand out litter removal to toolkits. Um, these are ones that individuals and households can hold on to. We don't ask that they're returned, they're yours for the keeping. They include grabbers, the, the litter getters as Mark called them, which is the first time that I had heard that term, um, gloves, safety vest, um, and our initial distribution, you know, we were just trying to figure this out and our initial distribution was for individuals and households to pick up, um, to call us and say, hey, we need a kit. And they would come to us and pick up individual kits where we thought, I bet there's, an, there's a better way for us to be doing this, for more people to get their hands on these at their, at more convenient, easier for them. So we partnered with Iberia Bank um, when they finally opened up their main lobbies, it did take a couple of months into the pandemic for bank lobbies to open, but Iberia Bank, there are 11 branches around Lafayette, and Parish Proud has between 30 and 50 individual toolkits located at each branch. We have a map of all of those branch locations on our website, um, in the solutions area of our website. Um, and we also wanted to diversify when, when and where people could actually pick up. So like Andy was saying, we said, get out in your neighborhoods, you know, the business parking lots that you work in. If you have a park that you like, walk to your nearest convenience store because we know that those tend to get pretty littered. So we were asking people, to, people at a much smaller scale to use these toolkits. And then we thought, okay, as we kind of get into phase three and four, how can we equip organizations and larger entities with bulk toolkits. So we have partnering stakeholders that have those at their warehouses. And if let's say the Boys and Girls Club of Acadiana wants to get their hands on 25 kits, we can connect them with that stakeholder and they're able to go pick those up. Um, we did start a social media campaign just to try and get that drumbeat going, just to get people excited about it and, and make people aware that, you know, people wanted to pick up. They didn't know how. We weren't hosting these big events. So we started uh, hashtag pick up LST, which was just our way of saying, you know, put the kit by your, your running shoes or by the dog's leash. And every time you're picking up litter, snap a photo of yourself. Just try to get people engaged. Try to get people really um, excited to play their role, even at a smaller scale, even though it may look a little different. Um, so next slide. Um, and really this is what we found out in the pandemic is that 
we can, it is possible to still try and clean up and beautify your community, even if you don't have these day long, huge events. Um, so collectively, it is possible for us to change our behaviors, the pickup behaviors, um, which means it's possible for us to also be changing our disposal behaviors. Parish Proud also um, uh, went in on a matching grant with Downtown Development Authority, the DDA here in Lafayette, where we did a one-for-one -one match on new trash cans that were better designed. Um, they were placed in locations that made much more sense and they were in a wider area. Because like Mark was saying, you really have to take assessment of where the litter is in our community. And as PPE continued to pile up, the DDA was, was marking that down and saying, this is where there's a lot of litter accumulating. We need a new trash can, one that's a place that has never had one before. So we did do that this summer as well to try and um, encourage better disposal behaviors. Um, and um, another thing that we did um, is we are engaging with businesses, just like Mark was recommending to say, hey, can you put up the sign that says, please dispose of your PPE properly. Um, we're just doing the things that have already been mentioned during uh, this session. And I'm just really happy that we're in good company um, and that we're all doing the best that we can during the pandemic and really being able to switch it up and, and show impact. Next slide. Um, and as far as it goes with, with how our viewers can engage with Parish Proud, you can subscribe to our newsletter, you can like us, share us on Facebook, all of those things, volunteer locally, do what you can when you can. Um, and we have volunteer, remo the litter removal toolkits at the Iberia locations in Lafayette. Uh, so keep us a lookout for those. And next slide. I think that's it. Great. And thank y'all very much. Thank you, Katie. We have some questions for you. Awesome. So Katie, have you seen with the litter kits, have you seen an increase or a decrease in your volunteer participation? We've seen an increase in requesting for the, the volunteer kits. We have emails, texts, we have a, a request form on our website. And that has been consistently active. Uh, so that it seems like there are new people interested in participating in, in litter removal. Oh, that's great. Getting people mm -hmm. uh, engaged in, in your organization. So when someone takes uh, a family or individual takes a litter kit, um, are they giving any information back to you of, you know, the pounds of litter that they removed or where they removed it? Are you, are you able to track anything just yet? So we're not able to track that yet. Um, we are trying to get QR codes printed on uh, leaflets that we put inside the, the actual kits with instructions to say, hey, when you pick something up on your walk, snap a photo of this, report report the number of bags that you collected, but really we're, we're finding that this is small scale. These aren't major cleanups. This is me walking around my block, you know, every evening and maybe picking up a half bag of litter, um, if that. So it's more of getting people to exercise pride, to have that pride, to make that effort. Um, and it's less uh, trying to get a thousand tons picked up because we just don't have that capacity right now. Um, but this is this is our way of pivoting in the pandemic. <laughs> sure, but you know when you are ready for to pick up those thousand pounds of litter, you're going to have a volunteer base ready ready to work with you. Right, they're equipped with those resources, and we all have their email addresses, so we'll be able to build that base, which is what we really are trying to do: is expand the number of people in Lafayette that have access to this and are aware of the challenge as well as aware of the opportunities to be part of the solution. Do you have a number in mind of the number of kits that you would like to um, put out into the community or is it just on um, the basis of your stakeholders, what they're able to, to provide for you with that? Yeah, so uh, right now we have 750 kits out in the community uh, we have just ordered a thousand more grabbers. I think that 2000 is like where I would like to evaluate and assess who's using them, how frequently, 
are they, what's their lifespan? You know, how long are, are they staying functional? Um, so we can better assess the impact and the, the cost effectiveness of them. Sure, sure. Well, we have some questions um, for Andy, and if we could bring Andy back and Mark, if you would, if you would join us. Hi. Hello. Hi. So this is a question for Katie and Andy. How have you kept volunteers engaged and motivated um, during this during this period? What is your communication? ongoing communication with your volunteers during this time been like? Um, well, what we've done a lot of is we're, of course, we're, we're constantly promoting on social media where we have several different platforms for social media, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, that we're constantly posting, hey, we've got this coming up or hey, get out into, the, into your community and do this. Like I, I mentioned the video that we posted for uh, with Stuart and Marie, just hey, get out there and and do this, you know. Um, post online. We have several volunteers that text us on a regular basis, you know. Um, we have a way for them to get into the website and to be able to ask questions and things like that. So, anytime that they reach out, you know, we we try to get right back with them. And also, we are continuing on social media to reach out and post things. And hey, these are the small things you can do. Hey. For instance, you know, Mark, Mark's talk was, was great it's because it's something I've seen a lot, but I was at Home Depot right after the, sometime in April, I had gone to pick a few things up um, and I noticed that there were just masks and everything everywhere. Well, a few days later, I went back, I spent way too much time at Home Depot <laughs> and um, I noticed that the managers there had taken some of their bright orange Home Depot buckets and, and put a, you know, a label on them that says PPE and they had um, attach them to the buggy receptacles in the parking lot, you know, so I snapped a picture of that and I put it on our social media and thanked them. Hey, thank you for making this effort. Was it ideal? No, because it didn't have a lid on it. And if a storm came through, you know, but they made that effort. They gave folks an option so that the buggy that I pulled out didn't have a bunch of PPE in it or things like that. So anytime we see someone making a conscious effort to do things right, I think recognizing that and showing it to others, it promotes and gives them ideas of doing the right thing. Sure, sure. So um, this is a question for the panelists as well as for the participants on the, the webinar. Have you received any um, negative pushback um, PR for having cleanups or public events during the pandemic? Has anybody experienced that? Um, I think we've made a conscious effort to be extra safe. I ha we haven't personally that I know of, you know, because we've made such an effort to say, hey, small groups, wear your mask, so on and so forth. Um, if, you know, obviously like at our Hasley cleanup in the photos, you saw some of the folks wore masks, some didn't. Um, you know, if, if you're in a small area of a cemetery with the family that you live with, obviously they're not, they're not wearing a mask. But um, we've made a conscious effort to push safety and to promote that you know we're having a pretty good size event this weekend one of the stipulations is you have to wear your mask so I think that because we're people see us making a conscious effort you know we haven't gotten any pushback from our that I know of yeah I think from Paris Proud's perspective as well I mean the same story as Andy's we also are having a pretty sizable event this this weekend, but we've designed it in a way that limits the number of people in the area as well as requires them to wear a mask in certain staging areas of eight people or less. You know, we've we've designed it in a way to be COVID friendly and we haven't gotten um, personal, you know, negative feedback, but we've also put on that safety lens. Sure, sure. So if any of you uh, participants out there or have experienced any negative um, pushback, please put it in the comment section and um, we can we can try to help you. One thing that I think both of these organizations um, have in common, which also helps, is that their local government um, is very supportive of their efforts. Would you say that, that that's true? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we have a close relationship with the Environmental Quality Office and the Recycling Office. Um, they've definitely always been a strong partner for us. Excellent. Uh, Katie, here's a question for you. Do the individuals that received the, the litter kits 
Um, do they get to keep those? I think that you said that they did. Is that correct? They do. They are those to keep. And it, again, it comes with a grabber, gloves, and uh, a safety vest. And right now they are being packaged in a reusable grocery bag. Um, but they have been in other types of reusable bags prior to that. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Mark, here's a question for you. Do you think that PPE, uh, PPE litter will continue uh, until the pandemic is over? And um, could you even estimate that a time that that could be? Could it be possibly a year or longer that we will have to deal with um, PPE litter? It's, it's hard to say. You know, I think the trends right now, I don't see any big downturn. In, in the data I've looked at thus far. Uh, so I suspect that as long as we don't have a vaccine, um, we're gonna continue to see lots of PPE. Once we have a vaccine, you know, there's a lot of resistance to masks anyway, and, and people don't like them. Uh, as a guy who wears glasses, I can tell you, I don't like wearing a mask because my glasses are always fogged up. Um, but. Uh, I, I so I, I do think that once we have an effective vaccine, you're going to see masks drop off. I hope that through education, people are going to realize gloves just are are not shouldn't be used anyway. What, disinfecting wipes, yeah, I think you know once people have, think they're safe with a vaccine, they're probably going to become a little more complacent. And so I would expect in the long term, these things are going to diminish. But I, I think they're here to stay for you know, several years at least. Uh, I wouldn't anticipate we'll see big reductions until maybe late spring, early summer of 2021. I have a question for Mark. Um, is there any chance of the medical disease contaminating our water infrastructure or is just the plastic that would be contaminating our water? It would just be plastic, you okay. know? The ultraviolet light is a great sterilizer and uh, the COVID virus is not a particularly robust virus. So it's probably, uh, you know, uh, um, Denise Lanclos, who's watching, just posted something on managing PPE in the chat. And I, I took a quick look at that. And it does talk about how long the virus can stay alive. So we're talking about, you know, days maximum. That was a big subject on the Marine Debris Forum. Uh, you know, is it safe to pick up marine debris? And yeah, I think the answer probably is. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So I, I the takeaway today um, for me, and I think for, for most of you all is that um, technology is very important than ever uh, as we navigate through this pandemic. And for um, the silver lining is that more effective and efficient way of managing volunteers with technology that won't revert after the pandemic is over. So that, that is definitely a silver lining. Um, for those organizations and volunteers who aren't as advanced in this area, um, what should they focus on to become more relevant? Because there, there is a whole you know group that is not technology savvy that doesn't have a have a Cameron um, you know in their organization and what what are some tips do you think that, that that they could focus on that wouldn't involve so much technology I'm really putting you on the spot here but I think um, starting with social media you know Facebook or Instagram they're both pretty easy to learn and navigate they're both free um, so just downloading the app and making a social media account for your organization. Um, we have multiple because obviously we're an umbrella organization for three um, affiliates. And so, so many people, you know, I, I know people from, you know, you've got your 10 year olds that are on Facebook and then it goes all the way up to my parents are in their seventies and they're on Facebook because they use it to keep track with friends and family, et cetera. So you reach a broad audience that way. Um, you can post, you know, whatever you like. You can update things, you can post events, you can create events, um, you can send messaging. So if someone has questions about your affiliate, they can contact you that way. I think that social media is a great tool to utilize because it's free. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. an excellent point. The, the recent nerdle spill we had in New Orleans, um, social media was 
instrumental in galvanizing a grassroots cleanup amongst the citizens of New Orleans on Facebook. And that Facebook page has, you know, probably got hundreds of members now, and they get together all the time to go and clean up nurdles from the riverbank. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a really powerful tool. Yeah, I would also say for individual volunteers, um, social media is awesome for organizations, volunteers, uh, mobilizing those volunteers. But for individuals, I may even ask a younger person that I trust to help set me up on these volunteer platforms. We work with United Way. We have a brand new volunteer management platform with them um, called Get Connected. And we've had to we've had to post videos, record ourselves doing a screenshot to say, this is how you do it. And you can either watch one of those or ask a younger person that you trust to help you navigate those, those registrations. Is that something that United Way provides for um, all communities, Katie? Not all communities. Paris Proud sponsored the one for United Way of Acadiana. However, it is all local organizations can post their opportunities, can post their community events through this platform and individual volunteers can basically seek the opportunities um, out that interest them. It's kind of the match.com for volunteering. Um, and so businesses can, can create teams. If you have a business or organization that always loves to volunteer as a team, um, you can create that team and get notified when opportunities are posted. It tracks all of your volunteer hours. Everything's automated from the organization's perspective. Um, and it's, it's pretty easy user-friendly for the volunteer uh, perspective. Excellent. Another another great tool like that um, website is justserve.org. Um, and that's basically what it is, is you can post events. They let anybody post an event. The event does have to be approved to make sure it's not promoting violence or something along those lines, but justserve.org. Um, and you have people in, in the community um, that, you know, are a part of that website. It's something new that we've actually just started participating in, but we had four volunteers show up at our October 24th cleanup and that's how they found us was just serve.org. And it's pretty easy to navigate. It's pretty easy to post your event. You could post a picture if you want of, you know, your flyer or your event or, you know, your logo, whatever, but that's another great tool. I have a question for, for Andy. Um, so with this platform that we have, I mean, it's very comprehensive and incredibly powerful. We're finding it somewhat difficult for the community to adopt it. Like, like Cabell was saying, you know, there's some people that just jumped right on it, but there's a large portion of people, not that they're not tech savvy, it's just yet another application or another tool they have to understand. So I don't know, have you found any helpful things um, to try and I think that's ease people's why, mind or anything? I think that's why I, I would, recommend one of the social media platforms that you know for say everybody uses um, right. because folks already have it on their phone because they look at Facebook 10 times a day or five times a day or, or whatever the case may be depending on age and you know accessibility but I think that um, using a platform like that and then maybe promoting these other things on that platform saying for more information or for more options go to you know and and list that I think okay. using those larger you know, more well-known options to promote may see that, we may see that grow. Great. There is also for affiliates that are um, participating in today's webinar or who may see this after it's recorded is um, Keep America Beautiful also has a volunteer portal that they just came out with um, this spring. Um, so, so check that out for, um, for affiliates of Keep America Beautiful. Katie, a question for you. Do you have um, garbage bags? Do you put garbage bags in the kits? We don't. We don't do that. We will. We do provide them at larger cleanups, like the one happening this weekend. Um, but for the kits, we don't. OK. Yeah. Uh, and question from Mark. Do you know of any research, Mark, that investigates um, to your point, and it's so true that, that litter begets litter? Yes, yeah, I do. I, I don't have the name of the paper at the tip of my tongue, but there was a paper published, I think it was more in the social science media in the 80s. And um, I can get that. Um, my, my email at LSU is mbenfie at lsu.edu, or you can use COVID-19 waste at, or COVID-19 waste at gmail.com. And uh, I can send that 
they sort of have. Could you have. repeat your email address? Yeah, it's COVID nineteen waste at gmail dot com, and that's the same one to reach out if you're interested in, in surveying PPE. But uh, there there was quite a lot of research done on this topic. I even think to the point of people kind of spiking areas with waste and seeing what happens. So yeah, there there is research on it. Okay, awesome. Well, that's all that we have for today. We have answered all the questions. Um, thank you, Mark, Andy, and Katie for being with us today. Um, we have a much better understanding of the overall picture of PPE litter on a trash system that is already under stress. So um, thank you and Washtenaw Green and Parish Proud, you all are doing some amazing work. Um, please join us for our next webinar on Thursday. We are going to study, have a study from Keep America Beautiful on cigarette litter, cigarette butt litter. Um, again, all the webinars are Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 to 1030 um, throughout the month of November. And we hope that you will join us um, again. Thank you. See you virtually again on Thursday. Have a beautiful rest of your day.